Hello and welcome to Differential Scanning Calorimetry Theory and Background. So first thing is, what is it? DSC, or Differential Scanning Calorimetry, measures the difference in heat flow between a sample and a reference as a function of time and temperature. You can get an idea for what this, act, this technique does by looking at the name itself, just like we did with TGA. Uh, Differential, indicating that we're taking the difference between a sample and a reference. Scanning, indicating that we're changing some parameter as the run progresses. And calorimetry, uh, that word means that we're studying the, the flow of heat or we're measuring the flow of heat in or out of the system. In this technique, we can determine several different properties of a material or a process that's taking place inside the system. Uh, examples include glass transition, crystallization, and melting point temperatures. You can determine degree of cure, which would indicate if a sample is fully cured or not. So if it was fully cured, you should see no, um, no cure signal. And if it's not, you can determine how much, what percentage of cure it, it has. And then you can also determine oxidation or decomposition temperature, although we typically do not want to decompose samples inside the instrument because it might dirty up the cell, but with some careful planning and preparation, it is possible. I just mentioned what different parameters we can determine from using this technique, but what can these parameters actually tell us? So we can use some of these parameters to determine the actual material. So uh, glass transition and melting temperatures are typically unique to polymers, although there can be overlaps. Um, you can have information about the breakdown of material, such as the decomposition. Uh, purity of a material, so if the material so say it's a polymer has been diluted with something or um, or altered in some way, maybe it was slightly degraded, you can, you can try and determine that too. You can also determine how amorphous is your plastic, so this specifically applies to viscoelastic materials. And then you can also you can determine how cured the sample is, we mentioned that, and also the heat capacity of a material. So these are all things that you can determine from those uh, parameters that we mentioned on the last slide. Let's take a look at the layout of the instrument before we get into the uh, how things work section of the video, just so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about when it pops up on the screen. So the, the, act, the most of the action takes place inside the furnace, which is located here. The furnace has inside of it the cell. So the furnace is where the heating and cooling takes place. Um, over here we have the auto sampler tray. So this is where the samples are stored while they're waiting to be ran. Or if you decide to keep your samples, that's where they'll be stored after they're ran. This is the auto sampler arm. It picks up the samples and loads them into the furnace, into the cell. And then this little um, this little hole here is actually the garbage bin. So after a sample is ran, you can choose to keep it or not. And if you choose not to, it'll drop it in this little bin, which is uh, emptied occasionally. And um, if you want to keep it to recover your sample, then you choose the other option and it gets put back in the auto sampler. This thick black umbilical cord here is what goes down to the chiller unit. So there's several different types of furnaces and chiller units that you can attach to these systems. They're semi-modular. Um, we happen to have what's called the RCS90, uh, refrigeration, re, excuse me, refrigeration chilling unit 90, um, which allows us to get down to negative 90 degrees Celsius. And there are other chilling units that you can get. There's one that takes you down to minus 180. There's one that takes you down to, I think, minus 40. Um, there's also like a liquid nitrogen quench cooler, which doesn't have controlled cooling, but can get you much colder, much faster if you want to do quench studies. There's also the standard finned air cooling system, which doesn't allow you to get below room temperature, but it does allow you to go much hotter if you need higher temperatures. So the instrument specs slide in a few slides will have what our system can do, but with the RCS90, we can go from negative 90 degrees Celsius up to 450 at the maximum.
If we look inside the actual furnace, you'll notice the cell, which is the picture on the left here. The cell is actually made of a solid body of silver because silver has a really, really high thermal conductivity and it allows the temperature inside the cell to stabilize very quickly from the furnace outside the cell. Um, inside, you'll notice these two sample pegs, platforms or sensors. Um, people often use those three terms interchangeably for uh, talking about the, the platforms. And each platform is actually a very sensitive temperature sensor. If you aren't familiar with what a thermocouple is, you might uh, go look that up real quick. But a thermocouple is basically two dissimilar metals with different resistances uh, fused together at, at a junction. And the uh, voltage reading off of that junction is uh, changes over temperature. So they've decided to use a type E thermocouple for this system because it is one of the most sensitive types out there. So it has one of the... Uh, uh, smallest resolution units of any thermocouple. If we look at the image on the right, you'll see a diagram of what the inside of these uh, platforms look like. So the junction of the metals, the two different metals, is where the temperature sensing takes place. So if you look at one of the, at the cross section of this peg, there is a chromel area detector that is fused to the constant tan body, which is the, the bluish part on the um, and so where that chromel area detector and the sample platform fuse together is where the measurement is taking place. So it can actually measure the temperature over that whole area. Um, and this happens at both pegs separately. So it's measuring the temperatures at both of those junctions. And then there's two more wires in the middle that are uh, measuring the heat flow between the two just to make sure that everything stays normal during the measurements. We put our samples inside uh, metal pans. So these pans are typically aluminum, at least those are the ones we mostly use, but there are different materials available depending on the needs. But aluminum works for most people most of the time. And you'll see the aluminum pans pictured in this image here are set on top of the sample platform and the reference platform. So one of them is designated sample and one of them is designated reference. If you flipped them, then you'd probably get an inverted signal. The reference pan is the exact same type of pan as your sample pan, but it's empty. So the empty pan should behave the same way as the pan that holds your sample, which should cancel out any contribution that the pan might have to the heat flow in and out of the system. Um, the sample pan contains your actual sample and any heat in or out of that pan should be detected by the sample platform. So I mentioned in the previous slide that the platforms themselves are very sensitive temperature sensors and so the sample platform is the one that's going to be uh, measuring heat flow in and out of your sample. Now you'll notice from the previous slide that the area detector is the top of the sample platform and the pan is sitting on top of the sample platform. That means the junction between the two is very important. So the pans have to be very flat on the bottom. And also you want to ensure that your sample has very high contact with the bottom of that pan. So you want very high surface area sample um, an ideal sample would be like a liquid that can just spread out into the whole base of the pan. Uh, a very non-ideal sample would be something like a sphere, which has a very low surface area contact with the pan. Uh, a powder or something that you can squish into the bottom of the pan is, is more desirable than just solid chunks of sample. There are two main types of signals that we get from the sample platform when the run is taking place, and those are endothermic and exothermic signals. An endothermic signal occurs, say, when your sample melts, it will absorb heat from the surrounding environment, and that sample platform will see a cooling relative to the reference platform. 
And then an exothermic process would be something like crystallization where it releases energy and you'll see uh, the sample platform would see an increase in temperature relative to the reference platform. So the plot on the screen here shows a few examples of endothermic processes such as glass transition, which is in the inset, and melting, which is the, the main peak in the downward fashion. There's a couple other types of endothermic processes you might see, which are evaporation of, of liquids or, or volatilization, uh, enthalpic recovery, which is a more advanced uh, a more advanced parameter to determine, polymorphic transitions, and occasionally some decompositions are endothermic, although most are exothermic, as you'll see on this next slide. A couple examples of exothermic processes are shown on the screen, where the one on the left is a crystallization, which gives you a peak in the positive direction, and the one on the right is a decomposition, which kind of trails off into this um, never-ending slope on the right. A couple other types of exothermic processes would be cure reactions, polymorphic transitions, and oxidations. So these are all things that would give you a, a positive change in your, in your graph. Here we have an example set of data, and it might have made sense to show you this example set on before the previous two slides, but I thought that it would be nice to know what types of transitions you're looking at before you saw any data. So a typical plot will have heat flow on the y-axis, which is normalized for the mass of the sample. So we always will weigh out our samples before we put them into the pans and then you input that into the software and it will normalize the y-axis. This is important because if you had two different runs and the samples had different masses, the intensity of the signal that you see will be different based on the masses. And so if we normalize it to the mass, then you can compare two different runs based without worrying about the effects that the mass has on that. The uh, x-axis shows temperature in degrees Celsius. You could also have time, but most of the time we're going to do temperature because we want to know at what temperature these things are happening at. In the very bottom left, it's very small on this on this plot, but you'll see the text that says exo up. So convention dictates that you tell someone when you're plotting DSC which direction is exothermic. Now you might think that a positive or a negative on the heat flow on the y-axis would indicate exothermic or endothermic, but it's all a matter of convention. Oh, sorry, it's all a matter of signage on which way they're measuring heat flow in the system as to whether it's positive or negative. So some plots that you look at may have the axes flipped and have exothermic down. They might have it positive or negative. As long as you look on the plot and you see this exo up, then you can use that to identify which direction is exothermic. Um, there's a few different things that we can see from this plot. So this plot was uh, PET. It's a polymer, polyethylene terephthalate. So this run started near room temperature here, and it swept in the positive direction at about 20 degrees a minute. And then it reversed here, and this is what we call a reversal hook. So this isn't actually part of our data. And then it started cooling down at the same rate of 20 degrees per minute until it ended at this point. So we have our glass transition, which is shown on the heating and the cooling curve. We have a cold crystallization, which is exothermic, that shows up here. Cold crystallization happens in uh, very amorphous materials. And then we have our melt peak over here. After it turns around, we then have a regular crystallization, which is different from cold crystallization because this is happening after the sample has melted. And then we have our glass transition on the cooling side as well. The last thing we're going to talk about here is the specifications of our specific instrument, which is made by TA Instruments, and the model is a Q100 DSC. I mentioned that the 
temperature range depends highly upon what attachments you have. So for ours, we can go from negative 90 C up to 450. Uh, our temperature is accurate to a tenth of a degree and precise to uh, five one hundredths of a degree. The calorimetric reproducibility and precision are both reference to indium metal because indium metal has very sharp transition that's very reproducible. So they claim to have a tenth of a percent uh, reproducibility and precision value. Our dynamic measurement range is plus minus 500 milliwatts. So that's how much energy it can measure uh, in each direction. Uh, the baseline curvature, so this is kind of like baseline drift. So they've measured this at a specific temperature range, but 10 microwatts is, is quite small and very good for this instrument. Uh, with a sensitivity of 0 0.2 microwatts, so that's the smallest unit that it can measure. Our system also has the optional auto sampler, which allows us to measure up to 50 samples uh, in a row and it has slots for five different reference pans. So you might not use the same type of pan for all your runs and the auto sampler can load and unload different types of reference pans to uh, help with that so that you can leave this thing running for quite a long time. Overall, this is a very solid instrument and we've been very happy with it. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at the contact info on this next slide and have a great day.